We're back. We're back. We're in the studio with uh, Slavoj Žižek, the author of Pandemic 1. And Pandemic Pandemic 2. Sorry, I butchered that. (laughs) Pandemic exclamation and Pandemic exclamation 2. Pandemic. Um, I'm not going to list off all of your other titles that uh, you've authored. You can go to Wikipedia and look up the bibliography. Okay, I have my first question for you is you're a very prolific guy. Are you a morning or a night person? Uh, it's interesting <laughs> point. It's a, quite a tragedy. I didn't yet discover a proper formula of my day. What happens regularly is that I sleep long, then mm. I get up earlier than my wife, which means that I have to prepare breakfast, run to a store if it's still possible, and so on. Then after that, it's lunch. I get tired. So what I wanted to say is that in this way. Almost every day I find myself at, let's say, 8 p.m. and I didn't do anything productive, reading, writing. So then I try to use that time till midnight, 1 a.m. to work, which means that that I never have a time to enjoy myself and so on and so on. I didn't find a good formula. Whom I envy is... There are a couple of persons, two of them I knew myself, and from history of philosophy, Immanuel Kant, Jacques Derrida, and uh, and, uh, Frederick Jameson, who I envy them so much. They have a rhythm. You get up around five in the morning, and you do the work from like half past five till 11 or noon. And then you are free all the afternoon and you go to sleep after the evening news at nine and so on. But I like this idea that there is noon or 1 p.m. and you are free. I cannot do it. Also, I have a heavy yeah. diabetes, so I get tired very quickly and so on and so on. No, But my idea would have been this, to rise early in the morning and to go to sleep earlier. But I can yeah, well, yeah. I mean, this work gives me balance is, yeah. is tricky for us as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so you're sorry, in yes. Slovenia. You've been in lockdown for a week, you said? No, no but we have not had another lockdown in uh, late March, early April. But yeah. It's a nice proof how, when do you feel really threatened by COVID, how it's also part of certain ideological, but maybe even more simply psychological mechanisms. I remember Slovenia, a small country, two million inhabitants, had, when it when the first wave was at, it, at its worst, had maximum 60, 70, like 6070 cases per day. And we were already in a panic. Mm. Now, uh, a couple of days ago, we had... 2,600 on a day, in one day. And people were not in such a panic. So you see, it's all, I don't know what you expect, perception, and so on and so on. Only now panic is setting in, really. Now it's by far the worst from us. Per capita, we and the Czech Republic and uh, Belgium, I think, are the worst in Europe. But maybe... So that I don't just, don't just tell stories. You know what interests me so much? It, when I say interest me, it means I find it horrible, of course. <laughs> yeah. Not only you in the United States, here also, all around Europe and here, the state is simply silently doing what I call following the Trump line, losing or renouncing even control. The first step was when they publicly declared that they are not able to trace your contacts if you are positive, you know. They cannot do Mm -hmm. this. So what they did is this. First, uh, now uh, 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 to get tested, you have to wait for days, blah, blah. Then uh, till four or five weeks ago it was that if you were in a close contact with a person who tested positive you had to go to a quarantine now they renounced this they said not enough people in the hospitals and so on if you are in a contact with a person who tested positive no quarantine you go on working till you feel that something is wrong now 
in many European countries, about a week ago, they went a step further. Even if you test positive of, or feel the symptoms, you don't go into quarantine, you continue to work. And because they lack so many personnel, nurses, doctors in the hospitals, it's simply that doctors with COVID are going on, working. And you, if you test positive as a private person or whatever, uh, they don't do the job for you. You have to try to remember who were you in contact with and inform them and so on and so on. So it's right. really that the state is renouncing. Offloading the responsibility onto... I find this horrible. Yeah. My doctor, an old lady with whom I have good contact, told me that it's horrible that now you have departments, of, yes, in our main hospital where positive doctors and nurses treat positive patients. <laughs> <laughs> it's simply positive. There. That sounds very That's positive. Very <laughs> um, but... but Sounds very positive. Um, let me ask yes. you, but on the, on the flip side, um, there was like a kind of a scandal in New York City, a little bit of a minor scandal because Cuomo announced that he would develop or either or, or roll out an app that would track your movements and your contacts throughout as, as you went, you know, about your daily life. Um, are, are you on board with that? Is that something that uh, you think? Here it will be probably a bad surprise for you. I don't, the reason I don't care so much about this is that I'm more of a pessimist. Listen, from what I know from my private contacts mm. uh, in the United States, that's all that I learned from Assange, Google, in, uh, in uh, China or in Israel, I know. But they are de facto already doing it. I spoke with an Israeli guy who told me that they are recording all phone conversations already for 15, 20 years. They're already tracking. They are already, so they are already doing all this, as we learned from all these Facebook scandals and so on. Uh, I think Julian Assange was right when he said that, that Google is basically a private version of, national, of NSA, National Security Agency, you know. So I find yeah. it's just a little bit hypocritical of making such a fuss out of this when at a much more uh, brutal level in all developed or even not so developed countries, they were already doing it. Of course, right. it's not perfect control because machines are stupid, you know, mm -hmm. because you don't have enough people, of course, then half the population would have to listen to the other half all the time. You don't get enough people <laughs> to listen to this conversation. So they have to use computer programs, no, and keywords and blah, right, blah, blah. Yeah. But no, you probably don't know the story. Uh, a British professor of literature who worked in China told me of a comic uh, complication he had. There, especially when there is the Tiananmen massacre anniversary and so on, uh, they, they, they control all phone calls, at least. Uh, foreign ones, international calls. So this guy told me he was flirting with a lady, other professor in England, and he, yeah. uh, he, you know the story about protesting, no? He, because they were all like snobby, literature and so on, he said, uh, I protest my love for you, no? Because in Shakespeare, <laughs> the verb protest means like defiantly, publicly declare. You know. Yes, right. Oh, uh, I see where the, this is going. The, yeah. the control thought protest reference to Tien and me. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the conversation was immediately cut off. And what I like is this stupidity of control. You say, you see, well, let's say, sorry for vulgarity, you can erase this. If you were to it's say, okay. imagine, I want to screw your brain out of vulgarity, it would have been okay. But because he got a cheap spirit, no? <laughs> It was instantly uh, cut short and so on. So what I'm saying is that, uh, 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 you know, the fear in Europe is more a different one among the majority. That all this control, uh, 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 recording or movement and so on, is not really efficient. That we are at a loss. Many of my friends, maybe they are secret totalitarians, 
are telling me, I don't care if they trace my movement. Just where are the results, you know? In spite right. of all these numbers are still exploding right. and so on and Surveillance so on. Surveillance capitalism. We have to admit, even doctors, that we, there are so many things we don't know. Well, I guess the... the Sorry, somebody calling. No, no, no. I guess the big question to ask, if you accept the kind of um, presence of these apps and, and devices surveillance and stuff in our, in, our, yeah, in our lives, then like... Um, is it just a, a, another kind of sub industry to create meaningless jobs, or will there be um, actual results? Um, I want to change topics a little bit. Um, no, no, so no, no. I mean, you. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> um, yesterday mm-hmm. was a very big day for the left. Um, what do you think of uh, Jeremy Corbyn being booted from the <coughs> Labour Party and Glenn Greenwald nice resigning from The yeah, Intercept yeah. in the same day? You know, uh, Keir Starmer, or how the recent boss of the Labour Party, said after hearing that report, that it's uh, uh, reading that report on anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, that it's a day of shame for the Labour Party. I think it's a day of shame indeed, but re- because they, they, how do they call this? It's not yet pure Stalinist purge, they suspended. Jeremy Corbyn. If you ask me, Corbyn was right. Namely, you know, uh, I link this to another ominous thing. I wrote a short text, but it didn't get very popular, I think. You know what happened about a month ago? Yeah, exactly. At the end of September in United Kingdom. Their Department of Education gave to all schools, university universities, uh, uh, high schools, and so on. Uh, it's horrible text. A clear, unambiguous order that prohibits them to use as part of the curriculum or literature any documents that criticize or are negative towards capitalism. And then they go a step further and say, because those who are anti-capitalism, that anti-capitalism implies in these terms, mm-hmm. uh, 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 limiting of human freedoms, advocacy of violence, and anti-Semitism. Now, I find this horrible. I think that, although when I see anti-Semitism, I'm ready to attack it brutally, but at the same time, I've already written about it. I think that anti-Semitism is today simply used to discredit for the establishment, if there is a little bit too radical critique of capitalism. You know what's the irony? That the usual leftist sense was anti-Semitism is anti-capitalism of the primitive people. No? That uh, right. really, uh, this figure of a Jew who grabs money and so on is a right. primitive representation of the capitalist. No? There's right. a moment of truth in it, but now it's a horrible thing, and some French new liberals, like Bernard Henri Levy, already said this, that no, that it's, uh, it's anti-capitalism today, which is a mask of anti-Semitism. So, again, the moment you are too anti-capitalist, you are suspected of being anti-Semitic. You know why I find this line of argumentation horrible? Because it itself, this line of argumentation, uh, mobilizes an old anti-Semitic cliche, which is that Jews are essentially capitalists, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, which is incidentally a crazy thing, historically. Like, look at Lenin's Politburo. It was yeah. the only case in Christian history where the majority of the leading body, those who really hold hold power, power, were Jews. So to say that communism is a priori anti-Semitic is crazy. But what I want to say is that I think that, you remember, they used this already against Assange. They used this against Bernie Sanders at the end when they tried to discredit him. They used now in Europe against the Greek guy, DM, uh, Yanis Varoufakis, and they already used a year or two ago, again, Corbyn. I think, I even know people, I almost met him. Corbyn is a wonderful, gentle guy. 
The problem is that I'm yeah. almost tempted to say he is too good for this world, you know. He's <laughs> absolutely not anti-Semitic. She just sure. follows, follows the line that I tried to formulate once a year ago where I said that for me, the struggle against anti-Semitism and the struggle for Palestinian rights are parts of the same struggle. That's what mm -hmm. all my group friends from Israel claim. They, they, said that, they said that today, to be really faithful to what is the greatest thing in the Jewish legacy is to try to understand Palestinians. So it's a very great exception. And again, I think this is what explains this uh, uh, throwing out of court. It's really uh, uh, an attempt to perch out of the political space a little bit more radical left. And it's happening all around the world. This was about another person, or rather two, three persons with whom I have great sympathy, uh, uh, Morales and Linera, Alvaro Garcia Linera, the ex-vice president of Bolivia, and mm -hmm. now the guy who even made a comeback, it's incredible, mm -hmm. Lucio Arce, because the first two were prohibited to participate in the elections. Lucio Arce, who was the mastermind, the minister of economy, during Morales' rule, and he did a miracle. It's not the usual leftist thing of, you know, screwing up things and then <laughs> blaming imperialists or whatever. Ordinary people in Bolivia, even the capitalists, never had it so good as during the 10, 12 years under Morales. And my theory mm -hmm. is that that's why there had to be a coup against Morales, Linera, and so on. Because, mm -hmm. you know, those in power in our establishment, they like the radical left to take power once every 20 years, and then they successfully through, through, uh, screw things up economically so that they can say, you see, if you allow them to rule. But in Bolivia, they succeeded. That's why they had to do it. Now we'll see what will happen. But I think that what happened recently in Bolivia, the return through democratic election to power of the Morales party, and in Chile, this approval referendum. Only now they will really get rid of the Pinochet dictatorship legacy. Because yes, in 83 on men, Chile did return to democracy, but it was based on a constitution imposed by Pinochet himself, you know, not, uh, uh, not to... Uh, 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 protecting the region, so on, all the stuff. So there are some interesting things going on here and there. But, but what do you think is in store for the Labour Party in the UK? It, it's simply that this uh, Tony Blair, more traditional orientation, took over again. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason I... I'm not glad about it. It's not only because I am a more radical leftist, but because, as I wrote in another text, what worries me a lot recently in the United States, in Europe, is this gap between representational system of elections and mm -hmm. the major and uh, how should I call it the gut feeling, the everyday life experience of many ordinary mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. and there is a certain level of discontent which simply cannot be translated, transposed properly into electoral results. Yeah. For example, I often use this example. Some 20, even more years ago, you know, it was maybe a little bit later, in the last years of Tony Blair rule in the United States, I was in England just a week UK. before elections. There was some big TV show, you know, uh, asking people, yeah. big uh, opinion poll, who is the most hated person in the United Kingdom? Tony Blair yeah. won by far. A week later, he won the elections again. So it's yeah. very paradoxical how uh, 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 this discontent, obviously there was some kind of discontent with the people. It wasn't possible to politicize this properly. It's the same, wait a minute, it's the same with uh, France. You remember, when did it begin? A year ago, something like that, the Yellow Vests protests. Right, right? yeah, yeah. 
when they well, tried to politicize themselves, they accepted the dialogue with Macron. It was all watered down. It was protest, which it wasn't possible to politicize. If the same happened, I know I'm friends with many of them, with Podemos, you remember, two years ago and so on in Spain. Once mm -hmm. they decided to enter the state politics, they are now part of the government. They became yes. just another, not even very radical, like social democratic, whatever you call it, party. So this gap worries mm -hmm. me worries me very much. And I well, think Trump also functions in this way. That's why against Trump, I don't think it's enough to say he's threatening our democracy, let's return to our democracy. No, that traditional liberal democracy no longer properly. Well, I'd, yeah, like, totally to, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to talk a little bit about Belarus, actually, because in Pandemic 2, in the chapter Father or Worse, yeah you sort of compare the protests in Belarus to the yellow vests and discuss about the way that the real trouble begins once you overthrow your authoritarian ruler, your batka, like Lukashenko. Yeah. But then you have to reckon with all of these you other know, things. Many people I know hated me so much of that text as if I am pro-Lukashenko or whatever. I'm not uh -huh. crazy. She's no, of course a nice not. example of what some of my French theorists already develop as the new uh, grotesque or obscene master. You know, Trump is also a master in this. You mm -hmm. know, the old masters, masters in the sense of political public figure, leader, boss, they played this rule of untouchable dignity. You know, this dignity was... Yeah, they were really aspirational. Hard. Sorry? They were aspirational. Yeah, Their image was aspirational. Yeah. Because, you know, Trump likes to use it. You know, when Trump yeah. said, uh, was quoted saying that the COVID will be over in April, he said this mm -hmm. in March, you know? And when yeah. he yeah. told him, were you wrong? He said, no, I just meant it, it, meant it in an aspirational way. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that, no, no. But what I want to say is that... Uh, Nonetheless, I, I mean, she should be dealt with. Of course, I absolutely agree. Lucas, again, she is a kind of a grotesque, obscene figure. And in, did you get from those or books, guys, the proofs or what or of pandemic too? Yeah, of course. We read so, the, yeah. You remember in, we the did our appendix, research. in the appendix to it, I went into it a little bit. This new figure of obscene master, right. in contrast to the noble... Ironically, I mean, of course, epoch of Stalinism where the leader was totally untouchable. You know, nothing should yeah. be publicly said that would diminish, undermine the figure of the leader. Now with Trump and so on, we have something very strange. We have a leader who already trips, behaves towards himself in an obscene way, if I may put it like this. You know, <laughs> that's why, don't you agree? That's the problem with all those, uh, uh, John Stewart, blah, 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 who, uh, uh, or Alec Baldwin, who make fun of Trump. It doesn't quite work because that he's Trump funnier is, than that. Yeah. Yeah. He's funnier. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. yeah, yeah. And you know well, with whom I okay. agree, did you invite her? Many people... Don't like her. And she's, I think, nonetheless, that, how do you pronounce Who's it? Under, Angela Nagle in her. Oh, yeah, we, we've, we've had, had her on the show before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She detected very nicely this tendency. And I remember it of how, when I was young, you know, the right tried to be dignified. We, the yes. leftists, were yeah. doing all the ugly gestures, <laughs> F you, and so on. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, the right is doing it. It's so much more efficiently. Well, and I think, uh, sorry, yeah. Did I yeah, let me ask you this. Um, my one minor, like, uh, I guess... Now you really question. want to kill me and you are mad. When you begin huh? as a gentle woman in this, my minor reproach or what? Okay, my I one, Well, my, my, my one minor <laughs> um, thing that I would say is... Um, I don't know, know how you should say it. if you want to be really violent. You said, I yeah. totally agree with you. I would just put some accent in a slightly different... Yeah, <laughs> we we have to top from the bottom. We have to be a little passive aggressive. But um, okay. My my one wine, minor contention, I guess, is like you calling this a new thing because I think there's a model of it in the Soviet Union with like Khrushchev and Yeltsin, right? The obscene leader. 
You Am know, nonetheless, Khrushchev, he began with it, I know. And he began already in Stalin's era. The idea is mm-hmm. that he survived and became the leader precisely because he always played in Stalin's, I read his biographies, inner circle, this role of, you know, drunk, fat, clown, and so on. So nobody <laughs> took him quite, quite seriously. But on the other hand, what I found so fascinating in Soviet Union, but uh, okay, you are too young, I remember that era. You know that now, not only many leftists had almost a good memory of Khrushchev, not because of of all relative relaxation, but do you know, like I will do a very simple analysis. Khrushchev period, at least in the late 50s, was the last period of the Soviet Union when Khrushchev and people around him, the ruling narrow circle, how to put it, it will sound very naive, still believed in communism, you know. They still mm-hmm. seriously thought they will maybe do it. With Brezhnev, the game is over. It's absolutely clear that from the very beginning he was cynical and so on and so on. Right. You know. But you should tell me if you have still uh, 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 connections in Belarus. You know. But uh, mm-hmm. I'm again not defending him. He became an embarrassment, Lukashenko. But isn't it true yeah. that economically, socially, Till two, three years ago, till the oil crisis and so on, he wasn't doing it so bad. Okay, he no, was he enjoyed popular support for a very long time. Yeah, but for I a know reason. It. he was, I know, a dictator and so on. But I think that that formula no longer works. I meant just in a very, don't you agree, benevolent warning. What do people expect? Look at Ukraine now. Where? Are you yeah, going exactly. Well, that's why it's sad. That's what's horrifying about it is that uh, it's very difficult to imagine a way forward. That, yes, Lukashenko yes. should be overthrown, but what do we do yeah. after that is... Now, my point was here another one. That's why I wouldn't fully compare them with uh, yellow vests. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, On the one hand, and I am ready to be corrected here if I'm factually wrong. Yes. Uh, On the one hand, some of their representatives sounded to me when I saw the interviews of the opposition Mm -hmm. uh, more like what Habermas called Nachholland Revolution, a catch-up revolution. We just want to become real democracy like the liberal West. Yeah. But are they aware that that democracy itself is in a crisis today? Well, that's that's exactly. another question that I, I have yeah. for you. Um, I was, you know, we talked a little bit about the Belarus situation and we talked about the situation in Karabakh as well. And one of the things that strikes me about these conflicts is that the there people... I am, I'm sorry if I will disagree with you, but probably maybe we'll agree. I will show my cards in advance. There I am for very specific private, not private, reason of my contacts, more on the side of Armenia. Because well, of I, course, yeah. know, I know my some of friends, Slovenia is, as your beloved president, not Lukashenko, but Trump would have put it, <laughs> Slovenia is a shit hole of a country, a small country where, and this is where I have a fond memory, incidentally, even from communist times, the last decade. You know, two million people, blah, blah, nomenclatura, didn't live secluded life. You walk on the street, you could have encountered the general secretary of the Communist Party walking alone without a guard on the street. So, mm-hmm. so my point is, everybody knew everybody else, and uh, in the mid nineties or a little bit later, uh, a friend of mine was a minister of science and education, and as part of the Slovene delegation, visited Azerbaijan, mm-hmm. where they had, I mean, this is a brutal irony, they had the best government imaginable. Didn't mm-hmm. they perfect this formula? The X. KGB boss became a national, was it Aliyev or who is Yeah, there? Aliyev, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a nightmare, no? So, and people also told me that you have this downtown wealthy with all the Western stores and extreme social differences. Plastic so. surgery, uh, Rolls Royces, yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know the details, but I am, are you also a little bit definitely more sympathetic towards Armenia? 
Well, my family is from Karabakh, so I have to be. She's from oh, yeah. Belarus. I'm from Karabakh. We're like from doomed territories. <laughs> Are you are precisely from there, from Karabakh. Yeah, my, on my dad's side, yeah, yeah. Anna's yeah. Armenian. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So I can't be. But you know, be. these are, yeah, but these are always problems, for example, not that I am for Putin, but it's true that, uh, how do you pronounce it, Crim, Crimea in English, that's stupid. Yeah, yeah. 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 But it's true that Khrushchev, when he gave it, when, only in the mid-50s or when, did Khrushchev give Crimea Peninsula to Ukraine? No? Yeah, it's but fairly it was, recent, yeah. It was a slightly meaningless, stupid decision. Like, why? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, but is, I think... Is there any justification? Isn't it true that Catherine the Great and Russians, under quotation mark, civilized Crimea, took it? It was never properly Ukrainian, no? Or was it? Or am I yes, wrong? Yes, that's correct, yeah. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's how Russians view it. But I guess my, my ah, question to you is that the, the yeah. people... In, in places like Belarus and Armenia tend, and Azerbaijan, for that matter, are very unironic people. They're not irony poisoned. So they take these kind of national conflicts very seriously. That's and I'm wondering... For me, yeah. Yeah, and I'm wondering, like, if there's a place even for this kind of worldview in our present kind of global network well, world. Well, till now, that was good about my own country till now. Now it's also turning crazy Slovenia. You know, mm. all my friends, when after they visited the United States, they couldn't understand it. They considered this a kind of a psychic madness that, you know, on some American homes, especially in the province, outside big cities, you find a national flag on a private house, you know. Yeah. For us, we are still faithful to the socialist legacy, which means, no, in the ironic sense, which means that national flag is what you put on during holidays because you are ordered by the state mm-hmm. to put it. It's considered madness to put the national flag on just like that, you know. Now, unfortunately, they are trying to. But you know what I suspect of this fanatical attitude? As you said, no sense of irony and so on. Mm-hmm. It's not just that I distrust it because it's too fanatical. I always had this psychologically grounded, I think well-grounded suspicion that fanatics are not the ones who really believe in this stance. And that's why they have to be so desperately fanatical. Now, mm-hmm. apropos, I don't know which, I think even apropos Israel, I... Mm-hmm. I Found uh, is he one of this, those poets? I don't know. Carlo Ginzburg, I quoted it somewhere, who wrote that you only belong to a country. This is the ultimate true love for a country when you are ready, when your country does something wrong, to be ashamed of your own country. No, and I'm asking this fanatical people are you ready when your country is wrong? to be ashamed of your own country. And that's why the most beautiful story, I think I quoted even maybe even in pandemic that I know, mm-hmm. is that you know that way back 20 years or when, in Israel and the United States, a group of Holocaust survivors who were old enough to be still alive and their sons, daughters, published a text claiming now we, Holocaust survivors, are ashamed of what Israel is doing. I remember that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is for me true love of your country. And mm-hmm. so if you are cannot be ironic towards your country or make bad jokes about it, you don't really love your country. And that's why, maybe this will amuse you, that's why I am sometimes politically incorrect and so on. And you know, ah, I must tell you this, mm-hmm. you know it. The most beautiful thing that happened to me is my younger son, when he was going to elementary school more than 10 years ago, had a black boy as his best friend, you know. Mm-hmm. And I was all the time, you can imagine, making, I don't dare to repeat them here, you will get in trouble, <laughs> bad taste, smoking, <laughs> racist <laughs> remarks. But this was our game among the two of us. Mm-hmm. That black boy, we were a go- So once, once that black friend of my son uh, 
rang the bell to visit my son. And yeah. she entered. I said, okay, because I was in a very bad depressed mood. I said, okay, go in. Nice to see you. And then he went in to play with my son. My son knocked on my door like that Marvin, Mar Marvin, the name of this black friend. He said, Marvin is worried. Why didn't you insult him? What's wrong with you? Do you hate him now? <laughs> yes, he got it. You know, without, there is no love without this irony. And I say proudly, I only had a couple of them, but in all my love relationships, mm -hmm. you know, we established a kind of codified form of this kind of mutual loving humiliation, which has yes, a very yeah. beautiful yeah. logic behind it. The message is not, I really mean it, but the message is our love is so strong that we can even talk like that and know that uh, it will not get hurt, you know? Like, right. if my wife asked me, what should I do? And my standard answer was, of course, jump into the toilet bowl and pull flush the water after you or whatever. I mean, there are much worse things and so on. But you see, this is, again, that's my paradox. This is what worries me about these people sensitive to their national identity and so on and so on. But <laughs> true identity, by definition, incorporates irony, mocking, making mm -hmm. fun of yourself and so on and so on, you know. And this is, for me, would you agree, but... I don't know, you are too young to remember it. As I always repeat it, maybe the biggest, greatest cultural legacy of Stalinist times are the best political jokes that I remember, you know. Mm -hmm. Now they mostly disappeared. I mean, you cannot compare the level. They simply disappear if you hear the political jokes they are on a much lower level and so well, on yeah, and it's so like on. you said, it's because Trump himself in America, at least, is so funny. He's yeah. imp it's impossible to make fun of him. Yeah, he's his impossible. own best yeah, yeah. parody. They, mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's why now probably you will not agree with this. But that's why I, it's a very risky move, I know. I think yeah. that, and Bernie Sanders, I don't know him directly, but I know people who know him. <laughs> yeah. Bernie he knows this and he did something very intelligent. Uh, he told a friend of mine who told me that his idea was, what about this old notion which was put in circulation, I think, by Richard Nixon, conservative, moral majority, ordinary, decent people. We should say, we, Bernie Sanders, really is with them, talks with them. My old idea is that if there is a postmodernist, totally ironic, brutal, tasteless smoking, Trump is a postmodern president in this. Mm -hmm. well, I, I, I wouldn't mean, disagree and, with and that. Bernie, yeah. and Bernie was an old fashioned, wonderful moralist, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's also why, uh, with regard to feminism, I'm radically pro feminist, really, I mean it, but not in the politically correct way. I think, mm -hmm. and all the women I have contact with, also theorists and so on, like, they have the same reaction with me as that guy, a friend of my son, Marvin, you know? Yeah. If I'm not a little bit vulgar, they start to worry. You know? Yeah, that's <laughs> the silent them, majority. What did I do wrong? So on, you if know? you can't be I a little bit that, misogynistic. <laughs> uh, don't you agree, it uh, got with this, that... Maybe you function in a different way. Maybe in other cultures it functions in a different way. But in my circles, a small exchange of obscenities is the, the only way to really break the ice and to let it be known now we are real friends. Well, you know? it's flattering. Like, it's like a... Sorry? You know how they say uh, imitation is the best form of flattery? It's not exactly imitation. It's a little bit of mockery because it, it, oh, it implies yes. flattery, right? It's yes, flattery, yeah, but yeah. my idea is here, of course, I agree with you, a step further that only through mockery can you really demonstrate that you belong to what you are mocking, making fun of, you know? I don't yeah. trust I'll let her hate fanatics, <laughs> not in the sense they are too fanatical, but they, deep in them, they really don't believe in what they... Like, I'll give an example where 
which you will find difficult. Uh, you know that when I was in Ramallah and some other parts of Palestine, okay, this is the most uh, bourgeois city life part, mm -hmm. I discovered that they have a wonderful sense of humor making fun of Christians, of Islam itself, and so on and so on. <laughs> Probably if I were to repeat in the West what my Palestinian friends were telling me, my if I were to be in France, maybe my throat would be cut now or whatever, <laughs> you know. So even Islam, even Islam is not as fanatical the majority. You not know. as humorless quite, as they might seem. They are, for example, I quote them in, I forgot which of my book, I think, Puppet and the Dwarf. The best Christian jokes, making fun of Christianity, I heard them from Palestinian Christians. There are still 5% among Palestinians who are, who are uh, Christians and so on. You know, for me, uh, and that's for me, you know what's the problem for me with politically correct stance? The problem is uh, that double. First, it tries to regulate what cannot really be regulated because it's a, it's, it's a domain of ambiguity, irony, and so on. And, uh, and what they don't get in some of them is that you can appear to follow, you can formally follow all the politically correct rules, but really you can still remain, your message between the lines will remain aggressive, racist, and so on. And right. on the it's, other it's hand, latently, you can make though. statements which may appear to be aggressive, but everybody will immediately see that it's an act of friendship. For example, and this is not yet, I think, in my pandemic two book I've written now, didn't you have now on the East Coast, there where you are, a big scandal with that, how do you pronounce the name of that old painter? Guston, Guston, oh, yeah. or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, Philip Guston. <laughs> yeah. Philip Guston. You know what, what shocked me there? The argumentation that some people, although she definitely was an anti Ku Klux Klan, she definitely was yes. against, and everybody knew that she was against, but nonetheless, people claim some people may not be ready to understand this message properly and so on. This is the symbol. liberal political correctness at its worst, yes. This fear that, and you know that uh, Slovene, some point they were more famous than now, relatively famous, hard military, not even punk rock, like Leibach in Slovenia or Rammstein in Germany, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Some of my liberal friends express this worry. We know it's meant ironically, blah, blah. But what if some people will take their imitation of Nazi rituals seriously? Well, who are these people? Rammstein are where one of their hits in Germany is links, links, links. Let everybody know they are not only social democrats, they are for the Linke, for the left party. Mm -hmm. So this is what is false about, you know, this fear which conceals a deep uh, a deep arrogance and patronizing attitude. You presuppose some naive, ordinary guy who should, maybe he will get it wrong, he should be. So let's take that Gaston or whatever. Mm -hmm. Do they really claim that there are some people who will mistake this? And what he portrays is not, the, his paintings, I looked at them, they are not caricatures of black no. people suffering. No. They are ridiculizing Ku Klux Klan no, members. I don't, and, and so I don't on. think anyone no. believes oh that. I think it's extremely cynical, and I don't think anyone really does believe yeah. that. Yeah. But they are cynical. Right. They are cynical. Yeah. Yes, the exactly. politically correct are cynical here. And now you got the, the, the truth, you think. Maybe, now I am going back, maybe the two of you are not so totally stupid because <laughs> you say correct things. Sorry, I always <laughs> dig my own grave because uh, now you said something wonderful. It's not just that they, those who oppose this, are, <coughs> are too severe and so on. No, I think there is something deeply cynical, as you yes. said, in yes. this politically correct radicalism. The problem is this, not that they are too fanatical, because you know what shocked me many times when I spoke with them is, but you also must have experienced it, because you maybe have the same problem of me, you are not purely American, you are mm -hmm. white, but 
okay, you are not purely American, but you are still white and so on, not black, Asian. So I noticed how, because you are still considered not the real other, to whom right. we should behave in a totally respectful way, what, they, they, they. <laughs> politically correct white minority, they are allowed to treat us in a way that if they were to treat like this, blacks or Asians, it would be immediately <laughs> considered uh, racist, you know? Like yeah. how many times, uh, 20 years ago, uh, uh, I heard when I told a simple joke, maybe in your premium Balkan you can talk like this, but not here, like, you know, all of a sudden, primitive Balkan and so on and so on. It's, uh, it's uh, so again, whenever I hear a politically correct stance, I ask, look at their own unwritten hidden rules. You know, yes, yes. the first thing you discover is that a friend of mine told me a wonderful story. You know, he was at uh, Syracuse, Mid University, Syracuse. Right, it's in upstate New York. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Itaka, Cornell, I think, doesn't matter. Uh, he was uh, there and he was part of a committee deciding on a job. And then he found the rules that a wealthy black guy was basically in advance closing mm -hmm. to get that post. But there was also a very poor emigrant lady from Korea, poor. And she also applied for this job. And my friend said in that committee, wait a minute. Okay, we have a black guy, but we have on the other side also a foreigner, Korean, and poor woman, a woman, and so on. And you know what he was told? Sorry, she is not the right minority. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, at least they were honest. This? Sorry? Yeah, at you least are they right. were honest about this it. This guy was <laughs> at least honest, because usually... Yeah. You are not allowed to, that's what I've written a lot about. I love rules which hold absolutely, but are not allowed. The, the rules themselves which decide what is prohibited are prohibited. You are not allowed to proclaim them publicly. And this is, for example, you must know this story, I use it all the time. This is what yes. I find so crazy about Stalinism. It was mm -hmm. prohibited to criticize Stalin, but it was yes. even more prohibited to say publicly, in our country, you are not allowed to criticize Stalin. You know? right. you yeah. say <laughs> Stalin. That's absolutely to, to, to obey it, you know. Well, it, Incidentally, it, it, uh, sorry, please go on. No, 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 I go ahead. In pandemic too, you, you made a, a kind of like... A, uh, uh, you talk about the how Trump broke the rules when he publicly commented on the fact that First Lady Melania was not ever flatulent in front of him. Like she never. Yeah, not only this, uh, you know what I found? I think I have a paragraph in the book. Uh, Trump is always reproached for lying, you know, all this text immediately. Yeah. How many lines did he, how many lies, sorry, did he say in his last interview? But what really shocked me is how, and here I think Trump is even more terrifying, how he tells the truth when it's too, it should have been too obscene to tell it. For example, yeah, do you remember utter, yeah. when he began to underfund, uh, 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 underfund uh, uh, Post, no? And the interpretation was he wants to get less Post votes because more Democrats, so that less Democrats will vote. Mm -hmm. And they asked yeah. him, and he said openly, because I want less Democrats to vote. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the third well, it's like saying that she's the wrong kind of minority. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same. No, no, yeah. Trump is here. Uh, uh, what do you think, frankly? Okay, we are a couple of days to the election. Um, I think he still has a chance to win, if you ask me. Yeah, well, we weren't. I was going to avoid talking about the election since. Uh, Let's since avoid it. Election. Let's avoid it. Okay, okay, okay. No, 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 no. But if we you can have talk, we can, yeah, we can talk about it you now that you bring no, it up. I don't have, I know, you know, because I would have learned, I should learn from you here, you know. I don't have any, I just don't get it why, you know, as if, is there some Trump, Trumpian secret circle in Democratic Party? Was it their decision to get somebody like Biden as a candidate? You know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> because, because they want Trump to win, yeah, 
Yeah, um, but 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 how is it now with you know? Okay, let me tell you another totalitarian thing, okay. which is not yet yeah. in my book. Uh, okay, you know when I had in my pandemic one already this idea of it a new chance for communism, blah, blah. People yeah. laughed, are you totally crazy? Don't you see the big capital, Jeff Bezos, blah, blah, got even a richer and so on. I agree, but my answer was always, uh, uh, wait, the pandemic is not yet over. And point two, mm-hmm. even if we somehow control, cope with the pandemic, who knows what will follow? For example, I follow all these things which are horrible. Too. What is happening now on, on the Arctic Sea, the north of Siberia? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. You know that in you, you're the, talking, the, the permafrost, the permafrost the melting Norris, and what? The temperature this sun was over 30 degrees Celsius, over 100 Fahrenheit. Totally yeah. unnatural. Then the metal gases are now coming out. I mean, I and my idea is what? I don't mean communism in the sense of a new communist party, but I mean something much more desperate. In Europe, we are clearly approaching it. Listen, uh, I follow here, maybe you read my last text, not in the book, uh, my friend, although I have differences of opinion, Alain, but you, Uh who propose these four features of a radical communist regime, no? But we are approaching them today. One is voluntary. Screw objective economic laws, just impose your will. Aren't we forced to do it today with economy? Mm -hmm. We simply need respirators and so on and so on. And you cannot fight, okay, maybe with vaccine, with, okay, we will get profits. But basically, no, you have to break, you have to act in a voluntary way. Otherwise, people will have starved and so on. Second thing, egalitarian justice, of course, we will cheat. But somehow everybody accepts that the vaccine should be a test. It should be available to everybody. It's ethically a monstrosity to claim just that strata or part of the population should survive. The third thing, now things get more problematic, terror. Yeah, we need terror, of course, not in the fascist or Stalinist sense, but in the thing of not only control, but whistleblowers, denouncing, and so on, and so on. And the last thing, trust in the people. Yes, you have to trust the people. It's clear that the state apparatus cannot do everything. So, of course, those in power are trying successfully to twist the pandemic in that direction. But I still stick to my analysis that pandemic was a heavy blow, even a death blow to capitalism, and that here I follow my good friend Yanis Varoufakis, that what is now happening is that, you know, when people tell me you are crazy, no revolution, the same system you go, no, but Capitalism is already changing. Do you know Mm -hmm. what radical changes are happening now to capitalism? Not because of any radical revolutionary movement. Just as Varoukakis told me, did you read about two months ago or when? When it was announced Mm -hmm. how uh, unemployment exploded, economy, the greatest recession after uh, early 1930s and so on, stock markets went up. Yeah. So the financial right. regulations follow their own path, which are now almost totally disconnected from uh, from from profitability of actual capital and so on. Things are changing so radically. A new form of capitalism yeah. is already emerging, well, and I, that's my fear. Sorry. Please. Yeah. No. I mean, but what the, what that says to me when um, financial markets are totally unglued from economic reality is that yeah. the vast majority of people are obsolete to um, the global elites. I mean, I think like you touched on this. I was actually really pleasantly surprised to see you touch on this. But in the book, you say um, essentially how the antithesis of, of Black Lives Matter is No Lives Matter. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, I want to, you know, ironic. Ironic. Yes, yeah, of course. course. But, but we, we have the same, we have the same joke to here on the, the podcast. One, to Comrade Stalin, no? Yes, yes, yes. I, yes, yes, yes. I like this idea of a triad, you know. 
All Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, no, Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, and then No Lives no Matter. Lives but matter. you know, now <laughs> I elaborated it because I will use it again in a different way. You know, it won't sense. It's a wonderful paradox. Can I go a little bit into not to heavy philosophy? Because of course. the paradox, this is the best way maybe to explain what Hegel meant by concrete universality. How the universal statement, all lives matter, is really a particular one. Mm -hmm. You know, you pretend to be universal, all lives matter, but you really privilege white lives in this formula. Why? And here I develop it very simply. Because in every historical situation, there is one form of racism, which is determining the predominant one. And you shouldn't nebulize it. Like, it's absurd to talk in, of racism in Nazi Germany without focusing on Jews, on anti-Semitism. Right. Because this is the forum. And in the same way today in Israel, it's absurd to fight racism without mentioning Palestinians. And in the same way in the United States today, it's absurd to fight racism <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> without mentioning blacks. So oh, yeah. we have a legacy. Yeah. yeah, if you are just universal, you are really particular. But mm. if you say black lives matter, not all lives matter, you are really universal. Why? Mm -hmm. Because anti-black racism is really the model, the structural matrix, whatever you put it, of racism. And next thing, why then? Comrade Stalin has to enter. Why no lives matter? Because I disagree here with George Agamben, who said we are becoming just science-controlled survival machines and so on. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, it's, uh, I think that uh, those who fight most heroically against the pandemic today, it's vulgar and horrible to dismiss them as just obsessed with survival. Sorry, if you fight against COVID, paradoxically as it is, quite many people, I lost some of French doctors here in Slovenia, they are ready to risk their life for it, my God. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. struggle against COVID cannot be, it's also a struggle for dignity. It's also a struggle for justice. It's not just this keep survivalist biopolitics, just numbers matter, and so on, and so on, you know. So it's a much more, much more uh, complex situation. Right, it's no, about no, no. In, this is in pandemic thing. too. Sorry, please. In uh, pandemic too, yeah, you talk about in, in, how, how COVID, e COVID, ecological disaster, and racism are all kind of connected. And, and comprise and sort of the, the bigger existential new forms. And that is crucial because I'm not saying anything original if you say this, but you must also know how the whole strategy is. Okay, no, I put it like this. Did you, I think a couple of days ago, Paul Krugman had a nice commentary in New York Times mm -hmm. when he referred to Freud without knowing it. You know that famous joke quoted by Freud that I used so many times, the paradox of the uh, broken kettle, you know. You borrow from a friend a kettle, you return it kettle, like uh, mm -hmm. you return it mm -hmm. to him broken. And then your defense is A, I never borrowed a kettle from you, B, when I returned it to you, it was still full, not broken, and see, it was broken already when you gave it to me. Okay. And that's Trump's <laughs> argumentation. A, COVID is uh, exaggerated, it's not a serious problem. B, even if it's a serious problem, we are doing the best we can. And C, remember a couple of days ago, some White House representative said, COVID cannot be controlled, it's just an epidemic, it's so on, it's so on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like... Uh, like, uh, 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 it's uh, important how they try to deal with it and what they try to prevent is precisely to see the link between pandemic and other, how pandemic is linked with our global way of life, with, uh, with uh, ecological problems, with other problems. It's crucial to see this, but I don't know how it is in the United States, there also, even in Europe. 
the typical conservative reaction is yes, COVID is serious. That's why to, we should focus on it and forget a little bit about coal, about uh, ecology, and so on and mm-hmm. so on. You know, they yeah. use it very manipula. Or let's forget about uh, about I don't know racism, about everything else, and so on and so on. And this is the big struggle today to find uh, to make people, but. It, it cannot be done just by saying this. In practice, people should experience the link. The link, oh. like, again, it's it, as uh, the one with whom I don't agree often, Bruno Latour, the French philosopher, how he said, COVID is just a dress rehearsal for global warming and other ecological okay. catastrophes coming, you know. Uh, yeah, I have a, a question for you on that note, because in Pandemic 2, and actually in Pandemic 1, you make a point that's very well taken that we need a, a kind of global disaster communism, global coordination that yeah. exists outside of the coordinates of the market, the values of the market. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and I was thinking about, um, you know, a point that you made earlier uh, about how, you know, we can imagine nearing the singularity, but we can't imagine a, a marginal, an increase in the marginal tax rate. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the example that you specifically in Pandemic 2 is, um, let me look at it here, Elon Musk's Neuralink project, which talks about like wiring everyone's brains, but does not in any way address the more obvious, urgent material conditions? You know? But it, I think first concerning uh, 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 Neuralink or in generally the idea of wired brain, no? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what I try to prove there, it's not just that it's utopian, because you know, at a certain primitive level it's already done. For example, mm-hmm. I read from a friend of mine, he gave me the news in China, no? In many elementary schools there, it's wonderful. Uh, uh, children had to wear a kind of a metal ring which uh-huh. at a very primitive level is measures their brain activity so that the, the teacher is not even obliged to look at students. And he, if, let's say you are dreaming, you are not following what I'm saying. Uh-huh. It will immediately show as your diminished brain activity on my soul. Things are moving. <laughs> but what interests me is another problem. And there I think COVID enters. The secret dream, not so much of Elon Musk, he is the red pill COVID denier, more or less. But of mm. others, say Bill Gates and so on, is uh, this idea that we should prepare for new social life where there will not be a lot of social contact, physical, bodily contact. We should get used to bodily distance. And so the idea is literally the matrix one. Ideally, you are in your own bubble, like in the matrix, but our minds are directly connected. And I just tried in the book of mine, Hegel in a Wired Brain, uh, mm. to imagine what does this mean? Like, what are we, when Musk says, which is stupidity, but it's clear where he is aiming at, 10 years from now, we will no longer need language. Language will be just an eccentric, aesthetic curiosity. No? But what is he talking about? Doesn't he get it that not just poetry, but all our interface, all our creativity even, explodes in this open moment when, to to cut a long story short, when you say something and you are not even aware what you said. You are, as it were, surprised by your own statement by saying more than end. In a little bit obscene way, I go into that. I even cannot imagine in this directly wired brains what would have happened of, of sexuality, you know, like all the yeah. erotic interplay disappears. Our brain is connected. Just right. look at each other and we immediately see, would you do it or not? Okay. But it's a right. terrible flat word. But the loss another of seduction. thing, sorry. The loss of seduction is... Is but, what you write yeah, about. but I don't mean seduction in this male patriarchal way, you know. Yeah, no, I understand. <laughs> yeah, 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 because people will again tell me then, oh, you have some masculine dreams and so on. No, no, no. <laughs> what I mean is just this, that I believe in the power of that everything that you say implies something unsaid. I'm well aware how racists and so on know how to use this. 
you are not directly a racist, but the implications are. But mm -hmm. there is another idea that came to me, I developed it, it's not yet in pandemic too. Namely, how uh, this really uh, shocks me, how it's simply not true those who complain that, like George Agamben, that with the pandemic, we are losing social connectivity and so on. Mm -hmm. No, we are just maybe up to a point losing bodily proximity with yeah. others. But socially, we are, as you said at the beginning, we are more connected than ever to digital media and so on. That's the paradox. At some level, bodily, we are alone. But at the same time, it's because our digital media are controlled phones and so on. We are more socialized than ever. So the paradox is that precisely today, in the pandemic time, where people spend enormous amounts of time on the web and so on, it's maybe more difficult than ever to be really alone. It's yeah, I think uh, we've become like more codependent or something. But to that point, I mean, you talk uh, like if you look at a lot of these kind of utopian proposals, they're almost dystopian in the sense that they kind of um, reveal an inability or unwillingness to do anything. Like on a mundane level, you see this even on the left with the whole with all the calls to like abolish the police, abolish the family, um, mm. abolish all these institutions. And in Pandemic 2, you quote Brecht as saying um, it is a simple thing that's hard to do. And why is the simple thing the hardest thing to do? Because... <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem because uh, no, now I will sound like a incidentally Brecht says this, you know, in which poem? In praise of communism, not mm -hmm. this communism. No, <laughs> There's a, 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 no, it's basically a variation of how we are often not even aware. For me, capitalist ideology is not some ideology uh, developed, deployed in complicated theoretical statements, it's our everyday life, and we simply accept it, that certain things cannot be done. And uh, th this is, for me, what fascinates me, this everyday power of ideology. Ideology, for me, is not, that's why, is not, again, something that you put in textbooks. That's why, for me, one of the definitions of ideology is that you claim the ideology is dead. No, the strongest period of ideology for me was 1990s, the Fukuyama era, where we thought we are the out of ideology. The end of history. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the end of history. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and, but that's why I see, maybe I'm too madly optimist, uh, as many commentators, I quote them in Pandemic 2, even in one, I think, noticed how, nonetheless, with the epidemic, things which were unthinkable here a year ago are now accepted. For example, just imagine somebody proposing a year or two ago, we need more socialized, developed healthcare. We need some form of basic income and so on and so on. And so on. Now it's well, accepted. Of course, those in power try to manipulate it in all possible ways, but they are already reacting to something that it's becoming more and more evident. So I think, I wonder what will happen now in Europe when things are really, you know, going bad, most of, most of big European and small European states moving back to a quarantine and so on and so on. Everybody knows that it will be, not to mention uh, health problems, new suffering, it will be also a problem of... Uh, uh, economic problem. It will be terrible, but what interests me most, and these are my favorite parts of the book there, it is also a kind of existential, almost, I would say, philosophical problem, you know? I don't think all people who protest masks are just crazy Trump nationalists. It's something horrible that is happening. Our basic mode of everyday life communicating with others, so, uh, socializing, and so on and so on, is interrupted. And it is a horrible thing. We will really have to construct a new normality. And this will bring, all my psychiatrist friends are telling me, tremendous uh, social, uh, sorry, mental health problems. 
I don't know how it is in the States, in Europe, they are exploding. And I'm talking about real numbers. An Italian psychiatrist yes. told me the uh, high school children in Northern Italy, mm-hmm. around 50% of them half have serious mental health problems and so on. Which in is the United States as well, yeah. Sorry? Yeah. In the and, United uh, States as well, yeah. The pandemic has had tremendous mental health effects on on people. Yeah, suicide rates. Say, yeah, yeah. I don't know. What, I don't know. I I think that the special problem of the United States is that almost nowhere in the world is this uh, conflict between okay, Trump is not a covid denier, but he is a guy who thinks covid shouldn't be considered as too important, some kind of normal life should go on. I think mm-hmm. that precisely this attitude of let's save our normal daily life, unfortunately, in the long term, it will bring us to a new barbarism. And I think... Yeah, and I think if, especially if you if you think of what they're really saying, which is um, let's save the economy and it, the, the kind of push yes, to return to normality, the, sorry, right? Sorry. <laughs> it's not COVID. Well, <laughs> if it's COVID, then I have COVID already for 10 years. <laughs> Because if you look at my old <laughs> recordings, I do this all the time. No, somebody already mocked at me, but you must have had COVID already for 10 years. <laughs> so, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's very important what you said. I read some good economic analysis, some of them even conservative, which mm-hmm. said that even from the economic standpoint, a quick early lockdown is best, again, even for economy. If you postpone it in the long term, it will be worse also for economy. Look how they did it. Horrible example. I don't know to follow it, for, but uh, China. And so that, not just China, so that you will not accuse me of propagating communists there. You know, Chinese don't want to hear this. You know which country is a true miracle? Taiwan. Mm-hmm. Okay. Big country, practically no patients, no, no, no COVID case. 30, 40, I don't know. It's incredible. Vietnam, no? Cuba is not doing so bad. New Zealand, mm. Australia. Australia had an outbreak, they contained it and so on. But again, true, quick, fast quarantine. Even in Israel, now it worked. They were for three weeks or what in strict quarantine. It's it's getting better. No? Yeah. It's, but I admit it, this is a real problem. As I'm saying all, again and again, a strong part of what we consider ordinary human dignity. You proudly display your face, you communicate openly with others, you know, yeah. will be lost. Now, does this mean the end of humanity? I think no. You know why not? Because Agamben, I'm friendly with him otherwise, but he follows this line. And he wrote recently a very interesting text. I don't agree with it, but it's very honest. Something like the house is on fire. His idea is that even if we are approaching total catastrophe with COVID, we should behave with dignity. Even we, if we see that our house is on fire, that our world is disappearing, we should gather the strength to go on as normal, communicate, Face to face, because then uh, he, Agamben, goes into Levinas, Levinasian territory. The face, the other's face, is our only contact with the abyss of otherness, of personality, not just object. I disagree with it at a theoretical level already. If there is a place where you really go deep into another person, but you don't see his or her or their face, it's psychoanalysis. Freud was very wise here. Yeah. In psychoanalytic session, it's not face-to-face. Face-to-face is just the so-called preliminary encounters. Mm-hmm. Once things really start, no. The patient lies on the couch. You, if you are an analyst, sit beside him. Freud saw this very clearly that face is at the same time, I would put put it, the ultimate mask. Right. That's why, not that I agree with, uh, uh, agree with, of course not, with, uh, my God, I forgot the word, how to call it, when Muslim women are covered, you know. Uh, hijab? Niqab? Yeah, 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 yeah. Not that I <laughs> agree with it, but I'm saying that uh, 
that because the problem with Islam I have is you no, know, if they praise so much some feminist Islamists that hijab enables you to retain your privacy, blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. Well, my answer is it would have been good then if also men were to be ordered to wear hijab, you know. Right. Like nonetheless, since it's only women, not men, no, That's you cannot <laughs> you cannot abstract from this idea of uh, uh that the message of hijab is nonetheless only men fully free being can mm-hmm. show their right. face. But um, I don't fetishize, I don't fetishize the face. I always, this is an old paradox that I repeat in all my books. The problem with masks is that, okay, not these faceless masks, but masks that you wear, a wrong face, that they can tell more about you than your real face. Did you see that Jim Carrey movie? The mask, the mask? I think. yeah. <laughs> it's the correct piece is that mask can be more you than your stupid face itself. You know, something yeah. that you repress, have repressed, yeah. can come out in a mask. When he puts the mask on, he becomes his shadow, yeah. his yeah. true self. It's one of his best movies, if you ask me. You know, apart from the utter vulgarity, dumb and dumber. But that's my <laughs> private secret. So, wait, I don't oh. want to talk about that. Um, on on the question of uh, psychoanalysis and putting on a mask, I wanted to ask you about kind of like a, a, an obscure thing. Uh, somebody a couple of months ago sent me a, a uh, essay you wrote um, that was an introduction to the 1986 Croatian edition of Christopher Lash's Culture of Narcissism. Well, I don't know if you remember text. this. It's too uh, orthodox. My reference there is Otto Kernberg, uh-huh. who wrote the big book. Yeah. It's too, too, uh, too, it's too traditionally psychoanalytic. It is. Although it, it touches something in me as a person, if I may mm-hmm. put it like this. I am a totalitarian, you know. I hate, I became like Goebbels and draw my gun if somebody says I want to express myself. Who the hell do you think you are? I'm not interested in <laughs> I your mean, that's deeper. How we feel here, and, yeah. and this is my personal attitude. For example, if somebody, friend or even worse, not a friend, starts to tell me his or her or their private trauma, sexual experiences, I'm horrified at this. Keep the seat for yourself. You Six know? feet away, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't like. I don't like this expressing yourself or whatever. This is horrible. If we look deep into each other, or me and myself, mm-hmm. we know what you find. Some dirty, horrible, masochist, egotist shit or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was so I, I, in this sense, I believe in dignity as a mask. You yes, know? I, I, I think that's agree. the Eastern way. That It's the Eastern European way, which Americans find very difficult to deal with. I mean, in American culture, there's this whole kind of emphasis on telling your story that I also find very uh, disgusting and manipulative. But um, yeah, yeah, absolutely, no, yeah, absolutely. This, but I, this openness is the ultimate manipulation. Yes, sorry, go on. Yes, it is. But I, I ask you about Lash because he's a like a personal influence of mine, and I found but that as nice. I did you meet him, literal person or just the book? No, 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 no. He, he, I, he died when I was like ten years old. But um, uh, I, whenever I talk about him, I, I yeah. notice that there's an unusual and incredible resonance with people, with like our audience of like young people who are- Yeah, because he touched something which was correct at that time. He saw mm-hmm. what is flawed and wrong in all that hippie expressionist culture. Not only this, even uh, my friend, an old guy who recently died, I'm not sure it was it COVID, James Hardy, the mm-hmm. cinema theorist who wrote the best book on Ernst Lubitsch. He, uh, uh, he, as it were, without knowing him even, applied Christopher Lash to Hollywood. And said mm. the greatest catastrophe was the actor studio, Marlon Brando, Montgomery Cliff, mm. you know, all that express yourself, you know. His favorite artists are Cary Grant and so on, who are absolutely not expressive actors, you know. Mm-hmm. None of this, show yourself, identify with, and so on and so on, you know. So uh, yeah. I I I I uh, still find some people. You must have met them. They try to dismiss Lash as secretly almost neoconservative, whatever. All the time, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but no, no, no. I am absolutely on his side here. But my, but my question is, um, how did you even uh, kind of 
Get her, like, how was how did he come on your radar? How did that project come about? If you ah, remember, if you don't, you can tell me. It's a crazy story, extremely superficial. Okay. A friend from Croatia told me it was still Yugoslavia. Told me that they are translating less, and I was still very young at that point, and I was interested if people invited me, and would I be interested to read? Uh, sorry, to read the book and write an introduction. It's as simple as that. That's how I discovered him. And then I immediately fell for it. And I <laughs> even read some safe heaven or whatever, some heaven in one oh, of, yeah, not yeah, heaven, yeah. heaven uh, in one of, one of some of his other books and so on, you know. But I think that after narcissism, that he was what, when I was young in the rock music, we called one hit wonder. You know, he had mm -hmm. one hit and he never really caught up. We need it again, you mm. know. Well, he said the same thing over again. Yeah, he was like very repetitious, yeah. but it still kind of holds so, up okay. today. Now I take this personally because I'm doing the same. You know? Well, we all do. We all do. No, no. My last books are struggling Here. again and again with the same problem, you know. You're playing the hits. Yeah. That's I, what people yeah. want. You give me hope personally because I, I, I now well, I see now how it's I will done. Take, uh, make a stupid jokes, but... As all my vulgar jokes are against myself, you know. <laughs> if I give you hope, then you must really be in deep shit. Answer to a student after some talk in New York who came to me and said, I would need a psychoanalysis. Could you be my analyst? You, know? <laughs> you, you are really mad. If you no, no, no. I mean, you give me a ho hope as somebody who, who wakes up late in the day and often Peter repeats themselves. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. Now this is my metabolism too. I think Doc is <laughs> of my friends, but still. Like, I'm actually, no, on the other hand, I have the real heavy diabetes, you know, it. Yeah. Is, and so on, which means I need a lot of sleep. So mm -hmm. I need like from 1 a.m. till 10 a.m. It's the yeah. basic nine hours. It's very sad. And then uh, and then short nap in the afternoon. But let me tell you something. I long for when I was still a strong Stalinist. 20 years ago, I had such a strength, not physically, but like spiritually. Bodily. Spirit, yeah, that I was able to skip two nights working in the, if there was an emergency. You know? Now I cannot even skip an afternoon. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's sad, you know. But I am naturally a workaholic. You know how right. I see this? If a day passes when we, because of uh, other obligations, blah, blah, I do nothing. By doing, I mean reading, writing, of course, no. I feel guilty. Mm -hmm. Strictly Protestant theological. I feel mm -hmm. guilty. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm absolute unconditional. Work. You know when I'm happy? Not after I finish a book, because this is the worst anxiety. I finish a book, and then I plan the next book and already start to write it. And then I can take a break. But because okay. then it's late for my next work. Once yeah. you know what your next project is, yeah, you can yeah, yeah, yeah. Without this, I, I cannot even survive. Well, well, let me ask you a personal question. What are you afraid of if you if you don't plan the next one? What'll happen? Ah, it's interesting. I am not afraid to die. I'm afraid of dying. Okay. Of okay. having oh, a way. Like, I understand the Brecht. I read that Brecht when he knew the death was approaching, he asked not only to be burned, his body, but mm. that immediately after death, a certain general doctor with the scalpel cuts his heart. He was afraid, you know, often, it happens quite often, I discover, doctors don't want to talk about it. That you mm. awaken a little bit, you can awaken, you are not really dead, you know. Often this happens that somehow, even hours after you officially die, your heart hurts <laughs> a bit. You know how they know this? It's horrible, they move. it's not a joke. When they move some cemetery, no? Mm. They open the boxes, the no? And yeah. they found uh, the bodies moved there and so on, no? So my fear is fear of dying, slowly dying, drowning, and so on. And then the other thing I'm afraid of, for example, let's say that somebody who is really close to me, love object, my son or whoever, would die. Where to die? 
no problem for me. I would just immediately focus on one question. It was it an instant death or did they suffer long? I would yeah. probably have killed myself if they were to suffer long. Mm-hmm. It's, it's an instant death. I would say, oh, let's go to a movie or see a movie or whatever. But this <laughs> idea is this idea is my my true horror, if you ask me. But I'm oh, slow suffering death. Sorry, can we maybe slowly, slowly bring it on? I'm getting Exhausting. Yeah, of course. Yeah, we can wrap it up. Yeah. Um, okay. you then, thanks very that. much. But tell me, can I ask you a mystery question? Yes. Uh, how do you survive? Is this your money? Do you get publicity? How do you? In, no, no. Here I'm pro capitalist. You know, I admire mm-hmm. people who, like, you found your way. How do you survive? Does this uh, red scare get you some? Money. money? So, yeah, so, this is our livelihood. So, how? so don't Where ruin does it the for money us. come from? Patreon. <laughs> Sorry? We use a website called Patreon where people pay us $5 a month to get an episode, extra episode a week of the podcast. Oh, really? Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. And the, the formula works. You get another idiot to exploit. How should I put it? Yeah, exactly. we're, we're using you. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's wonderful. That's, that's wonderful. Yes. Because, you know, here I'm not the stupid old-style communist. No, no. There are levels. Don't you agree? Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There, are well, is very there, there should be yeah. a space for people who find their way. You know who know who knew this very well. In contrast to to Yeltsin catastrophe, I think mm. Yeltsin opened up the path to Putin when he screwed it up economically. Mm-hmm. The Chinese knew it very well. Don't begin with privatizing banks and profitable oil companies. Begin at everyday level. You know, small initiatives, stores producing. Small, their capitalism works, my God. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, so yeah, I'm I, not, I'm not a, a naive guy, but I'm so glad that. And what did COVID do to you? Wait, it, we made a lot no, of no, money. No, no, no. I'm not asking a private medical question. Uh, no, I understand. Yeah, no. But we, I mean, we, financially, was it good for you? It was good for us, yes, because lots of people like to listen to podcasts when they can't yeah, leave their homes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> and how did you? Overcome because you are quite well known. I checked you on Wikipedia and so on. How did you? Was it never a problem? The fact that you are not real Anglo-Saxon Americans. It was never a problem. It worked well. For, for us, I think it's well, kind of our shtick. It worked out for us because we started when the whole Russia Gate thing was really uh, exploding. Uh-huh. Americans are very interested in in Russians. Did you uh, see the TV series? I quite liked it up to a point. I don't have time to watch them. Americans of two I did, yeah, I, I enjoyed yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know which series I now saw, and some of my friends, like Alenka Zuban, think that the guys maybe really knew of us. Rake, not rape, key, like K, Rake, R A T E, an Australian series about a crazy lawyer. Um, and there are so many references to my Alenka Zupancic, Mladen Dolar's texts, you know. Like a guy, a lawyer says, this is not only nothing, this is less than nothing. Then <laughs> that's not my book. Then another guy <coughs> develops a point about Preston Sturgis, I think Sullivan's Travels, or with comedy, which is as if taken from Alenka Zupancic's book and so on. So uh, don't underestimate Australia. In the sense I wouldn't be surprised. They, yeah. have, they have good TV series there, you know. Uh-huh. That's for me civilization. I think serious civilization is defined by two things: that you have good detective writers and good TV series. That's why Iceland, Reykjavik, and so on. Are, I love them. My favorite mm-hmm. place almost in the world. They have now Valhalla Murders and so on, excellent TV miniseries, mm-hmm. you know. I I cannot. I was going to ask you for your recommendations. <laughs> That's but, a good yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah. But you can get them, you know. Yeah. Long Live, Pirate Bay, and so on. Yeah. I met when I was the last time in Sweden the guy who was the first who put together Pirate Bay. And he told mm-hmm. me a wonderful story how respect survives. He was put in prison for a couple of months, you know, oh. uh, because of Pirate Bay. And yeah. there, not only were the guards very respective towards him, but they asked him for autograph and allowed him <laughs> to it still, it still works. 
you know. Well, it's like you say in Pandemic too about the Somali pirates. They had to turn to piracy because their oceans were depleted. And we had know, to turn I to don't, I don't, I don't sympathize with them, but it's true. People often it's, it's think these are just yeah. violent yeah. mass things. They don't, they don't know this, my God, no? Uh, how will your, Bela, your Belarus do now? Because one of the main sources was reselling cheap, cheap Russian oil. No, no, the time is yeah. over. Well, there's a big tech sector. There's a big, um, there's a lot of tech IT workers yeah. in Belarus who are sort of at the forefront of the of the political opposition. From yeah, what yeah. I understand. So uh-huh. they'll transition to a liberal hmm. democracy. <laughs> when it's Ingenia, tech economy. I think, you know, when I was the last time, some three years ago in. Petersburg, but this is prohibited name. I don't know Petersburg, I only know Leningrad. When I was in mm-hmm, Leningrad, yeah. you know that <laughs> opposite my hotel was something called Belarusian, a Belarusian food store. And I, huh. I didn't know, you know what was the point? Belarusians did an ingenious thing, friend, expect me. You know, the Crimea occupation, blah, blah, and then boycott of Russia. Yeah. Uh-huh. But Belarus was not under boycott. They opened out in all Russian cities dozens of stores where you get typical Belarusian products, Stilton, Camembert cheese, French pâtés, and so <laughs> on, you know. You just imported it, package them, and oh my God, that should survive. Lukashenko is bad. <laughs> that spirit should, should survive, I think. No, But sorry, if you are from uh, nagorno Karabakh, do you have some latest news? How does it look like? Sorry? Because now Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan is now again making an attack, no, or how? Are you a pessimist there? How will it end? The war? Um, uh, yeah, I'm a pessimist because Azerbaijan is aligned with uh, uh, Israel. Uh, and, also, you know, is, but you sorry? know what? This is the perversity. Azerbaijan yeah. has Israel and Turkey. Yes, and, yes. And, and, and I mean, you know, like the there's a, obviously a historic quarter in Jerusalem of Armenians, the... Hitler yeah, I think, what about alluded that? to what planning about, yeah, yeah. the genocide or the Holocaust yeah. based on the Armenian genocide. Yeah. It's very perverted, yeah. But, no, but you know. this is this is yeah. But but where is Putin here? Doesn't uh, Armenia have a special military pact with Russia? No, Putin is afraid. Yes. to... Yeah, well, I think this is a big. Pro- it's sort of like a proxy war of of uh, Russia and Turkey, as I understand it, for influence in the region. So yeah, but, I think I think the fact that Russia, horror. yeah. No, I mean, it gives me no pleasure, horror. but I think that Sorry. Russia, you know, Russia being on the side of Armenia is is the bulwark that uh, keeps them from being <clears throat> annihilated, essentially. Ah, so, in, uh, so it has some good points. Nonetheless, it's because of this that Azerbaijan cannot make a, a total attack on... Uh, I think like, historically, yeah. Because, I mean, the thing with Belarus and, and, and Armenia or Karabakh is that these are kind of totally forgettable Shit countries, countries. <laughs> that nobody cares about in the West. Hmm. Uh, yeah, but nonetheless, I, I like these small countries, even even uh, Georgia, Gruzia, no? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was really popular before COVID as a food tourism destination, yeah. even in my country, Slovenia and the so Italy on. No? The Italy Caucasus. These, yeah. are, these, are, these are nice countries, but how is Armenia doing? Very bad, not too bad economically. I think it's doing pretty terribly. I, there's probably a very high... Oh my God, yes. Yeah, there's probably a. There also, I think, um, if you, I've heard, I haven't been there yeah, ever yeah. because I'm from yeah, yeah, Moscow, yeah. but I've heard that um, there's also kind of like this burgeoning tech sector. People are oh, yeah. like young people are throwing themselves into, headlong into kind of neoliberalization. Everybody speaks oh, English in Yerevan, this sort of thing. Um, yeah, but yeah, nonetheless, it, what you mentioned we, now, you know how often I mentioned it. Erevan, Erevan, my favorite city in the world, you know. Erevan, Radio <laughs> Erevan jokes, you know. They, they are among... You mentioned Erevan, no? Yerevan, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Is this, isn't this the standard topic of the best Soviet jokes? A listener uh, asks Radio Erevan. I only know the racist ones. <laughs> Which are, no, 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 but I know, like, the one that I all the time quote, you know, about Rabinovich, you know. I begin even my book with uh, 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 a listener asks Radio Yerevan, is it true that Rabinovich won a new car on lottery? No. 
Mm-hmm. And that was the answer. In principle, it's true. Thus, thus, it wasn't a new car, but an old bicycle. And he didn't <laughs> win it. It was stolen from him. You know? <laughs> the formula there is always this one. You know, in principle, it's true, but... No, right, no, no, yeah. I, I, but, but this is probably the mythical Russian Yerevan. No, this, this. Do we have a great tradition? How is it in Belarus? Are there jokes about uh, Batka, about Lukashenko, or it's too traumatic to make jokes? Um, I don't know. I don't. I have some family there, but I don't, that I'm not very close to, so I don't know what yeah. they. Well, they call it the Slipper Revolution because they started calling him like Sarakan, like they're gonna like. Like the way you use a slipper mm. to squash a bug. Mm. That Another kind of like extremely the dirty around. politically correct question. If you mm. are, I'm not saying you should be not gay, but lesbian, but hetero. Did you ever have sexual dreams? I hope not. About Lukashenko's son. He's no procadet. He's, he's, he's a very handsome boy. He's a very handsome boy. He's the Baron. I propaganda or is he genuinely popular there? Maybe he was. I don't know. His son? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know, but tr- I find Trump's son Baron to be also very a very beautiful boy. Yeah, yeah, but but isn't it something like a little bit restrained? There were even rumors that uh, okay, we in Slovenia are proud about it because mm. the usual, the myth is that Melania is speaking to him in Slovenia also because uh-huh. yeah because we've Baron never heard him speak her. so he might yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if Baron Trump spoke a little Slovenian. Yeah, although he, he uh, Melania, ignores all Slovene links, you know. They tried to get some statement from her and so on. They secretly hope that she will visit Slovenia. My God, oh. she was born. But, no, no, no. She, she's, I heard the rumor of a Slovene embassy in Washington that she's totally under control. Like, you know, every public move, Trump people control her and so on and so on. He's heavily you surveilled. Know. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's a but flattering Kamala image. Kamala Harris, I find it nice when Trump says, said about Kamala, did you read, hear this, that she's not only a socialist, she's much worse, she's a communist. <laughs> I didn't I hear wish. that. I, I, I was hoping he'd say she had a strong and developed upper body or something <laughs> to that effect. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it's, uh, uh, but I think... This is not just an exaggeration, a joke, you know. These mm. titles nonetheless define our reality, how uh, this perception, because in Trump's view, there is no liberal center. You are either for him or you are a socialist yeah. communist, you know. Right. It's, it's almost like inverted Stalinism. Therefore, Stalinists, if you are against Stalin, you are a neo fascist or whatever. Right. You know, it's horrible. Listen. I have to stop now. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. yes, we'll let you go. Please Thank you so much. Can me I can a little bit, a little bit, do, and I hope that I will bring you some five dollar idiots, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think you, you will. Can I you ask you experiment, or you want to be honest? Did you at some point like try to raise it to ten or lower it, and then find the there's optimal. different. There's a sliding scale. There's a sliding yes. scale, so people can choose. Some people give us more money just for fun. Yeah. Really? Oh, you but should five, five five is the minimum. support this fun, this type of humor, giving you more money. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I really wish you all the best, all success. We wish Thank you the best, too. Thank you. Thank you. Don't, make it, uh, don't make me appear too nervous and stupid if you can do some benevolent censorship when I am too well. stupid. Thank you very much. And Thank go you. on, please. Thanks. Thanks. And I, let's hope that we will survive this shit, you know. But in New York, we're a little bit better now, no? We are, yes. Yeah, we'll yeah but be... still, is it true that still, I mean, we'll, that, that downtown Soho and so on, that it's still half dead, it's not really alive again, no? It, so, yeah, yeah, but that was before COVID. It, the, there, a lot of the storefronts couldn't pay their rent, so it was already pretty kind of I crappy. Horrible, yeah, but, but I it's different, but it the, does feel alive. Just in this COVID year, that from Manhattan, only almost half a million rich people moved out, you know? Yes, buying yes, houses yeah. in where, where New Hampshire and all that Long Island area and so on, you know? Yeah. Please. All the best to you and survive. Thank you, Slava. How do I go out here? Ah, okay, I will learn. Have a time. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.